Yeah. And welcome to the Psychic Hour Shop. I'm Ace tonight, and with me tonight is the wonderful Miss Rainy Love. How are you, darling? I'm wonderful. How are you? Oh, just being totally evil as normal. You know, it's May, and you know, some crazy fool thought he could book two festival or that you know he's working on in the same month, and it would be no big deal. Uh huh. Yeah. Oh me. You know, if it's hard, complicated, and sometimes a little aggravating, I'm up for the challenge. Not a problem. <laughs> it's that spring fever, I say. <laughs> uh, spring fever. I call it winter delirium, honey. I started in October on both of these. Okay, I'll, I'll go for that. Winter is delirious. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So did you get to watch the wedding this week? I did. Wasn't that dress simple and gorgeous? It really Absolutely. reminded me a lot of Queen Grace's dress. Yes, actually. Grace Kelly? The same thing. Yes. Yeah. I thought the same thing. Yep. And I loved the veil. Oh, that was gorgeous. I, that was just a yeah. sheet of lace, honey. So simple. Yeah. What I loved was the kiss. Yeah. Not the one that everyone expected, but the longer one. Well, yeah, because, yeah. you know, I remember when Princess Di got married, they weren't allowed to kiss. And everybody was waiting for them to sneak off in private so they could see if they could catch the kiss. You know, this was uh-huh. so much more different. He didn't shave. Apparently, you're supposed to shave as tradition. Um, there are so many things they did about this that are so different, and so modern, and update. I thought it was wonderful. Right. It was and, wonderful. you know, the mother of the bride was dressed so elegantly. I know. She was beautiful. Mm-hmm. She was beautiful. Now, was you know, they also, it was a little interesting. You know, because in the past, you know, there's been royal weddings, and we knew they had security. We knew they had, you know, this, that, and another. This one, they stepped up a little bit, I think. What about you? I mean, I don't think Princess Diana had snipers on the door, you know, on the rooftops. No, but you also have to look at it. We're in a different day and time than we were back then. We are. You know, we still could go to the airport and... Our family could come up and, you know, kiss us and hug us as we were getting on the airplane. And life has changed since then. So it has I can a see lot. why there's more security now. You yeah, know, I can I see there are there's more security. I don't think it's necessary. I also, you know, I think it's necessary that we have that security. But I'll have to give it to the cameraman. Not one of them. I mean, not one of them, and I've seen them all, BBC, ABC, NBC, not one of them caught a sniper on camera. 
I was like, good job. Yeah. Actually, that's good because that would have taken away from the wedding. We well, it not only would it have taken wedding. away from the wedding, but, you know, that means they can use this plan again. You know, they don't have to go, well, yeah. you know, John got a shot on camera, so we have to go move everything. Right. Exactly. Exactly. No, I thought it was wonderful. Um, it was new, mm-hmm. modern, updated. You could definitely see a little mm-hmm. bit of American, you know, in there. You know, it was a wonderful, uh, I think, tribute to the African-American community, you know, I which do. is totally new for this family. <laughs> well, awesome. yes and no. <laughs> I think it was good that they had an, an American priest brought over. he done a very good speech. I understand the uh-huh. princess and the prince and the queen all signed off on the speech. Now, granted, I really? think it should have been a little bit more focused. Yes. Uh, honey, do you think anything is going to go on in that, in that family that the queen doesn't sign off on? Well, yeah, you're probably right. She's more controlling right. than I am. Yeah, you're probably right. What I would have liked to have seen is the royal family surrounding her mother a little bit more. I would have liked mm-hmm. to have seen that. I think that would have gone a little bit too modern. You think I so? think the division, yeah, I think I would have liked to see more of her family there. But then we look at her family and go, well, you know, how much level of psycho can you put up with? Exactly. And that's why I think they should have surrounded her. You know, I know when I got right. married, granted, I'm not, well, I think I'm royalty, but you know what I mean. You mm-hmm. know, obviously, you know, my husband's family, you know, they're from they're from out of town, out of state, across the country. So obviously there weren't as many representatives there. So we kind of made mm-hmm. a choice to kind of intermingle, to make it a little bit mm-hmm. more mm, together. Right. You know, I suppose maybe you can't do that in this type of situation. But heck, I think Probably somebody not. could have gone over there and sat with her. Well, I think someone could have gone over there and sat with her, but the other side of that coin is is then that makes her more of a target. You know, because we're looking, you know, looking at it from a tactical situation, it's easier uh-huh. to have the two ones that they are going to be aiming at in one little spot. That way you can evacuate all of them at one time. Okay, I'll give them that. I'll yeah. give them that. You know. But that, I, I, I think she think deserved the dignity. Well, you know, coming to think about it, because she was a single mother. Yeah. You were a single mother. Would you want yes. to do your ex-husband to sit beside you at the wedding? He sat beside me at my father's funeral, so yeah. Well, uh, that's a little different. You know, this is the work that she done on her own. From what I understand, the father has been in Mexico probably since after the child was born. You know, the fertility yeah. test came in and he took off. Um, yeah. which he's a stunt queen, okay? Just in general, yeah. he's a stunt queen. We all know that. Um, and, you know, please, that was so ridiculous. Well, yeah, and, uh, you know, they are known for their gossip there, you know, and, uh, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, the best tabloids come out of there. Oh, yeah. And, you know, from what I understand, they are – They make us look like nothing, nothing, Mm -hmm. you know. I mean, they're good from what I understand. I I don't know if I'd want to be a part of the tabloids over there, you know, the paparazzi, if you will. But uh, Mm -hmm. the thing about, you know, you know, Harry is he's always been a little bit of a rebel. Mm -hmm. And some of the things that she was having to deal with. You know, just with all the gossip and all that, um, I think he was a really good choice for her as a husband because I think he's very capable of standing up and saying, "Yeah, this isn't gonna fly. I'm not putting mm-hmm. up with this." You know, and I think it just turned out really sweet, beautiful, and wonderful. Mm-hmm. And uh, I loved that. I like that Charles that walked again. her down the aisle. Yes. Yes. Which I yeah, I like. think that was befitting. Yeah, 
I think I and I like the kids at the it. wedding. I think that was cute too. Oh, they were adorable. And if <laughs> yeah, and the they Duke so and cute. Duchess of Saxton. That is their new official titles. They are no longer prince and princess. They're dukes and duchesses. Already yeah. on the job. Three days after the royal wedding, they're on I the job. Know. I, they're going. I went, where's your honeymoon? <laughs> well, apparently they aren't planning one um, anytime oh. soon because, you know, it's the royal schedule and it is the season and they can't miss yep. the season. True. Um, True. Now, it was interesting that Oprah was there, so I'm thinking that there's going to be an Oprah story. Yeah, I was kind of wondering that, too, because I thought, I don't imagine she's best friends with Oprah. Mm -mm. I don't think she has anything against her or anything. I just, I don't imagine that she's a close personal friend. I was like, why is Oprah here? Well, you know, I think that she's going to do the, the, she'll do the first interview. Could very well be. Could very well be. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, um, candle in the wind, candle in the wind, candle in the wind. Mm-hmm. Oh, what is his name? Candle in the wind. I should know this. Candle in the oh, wind. Oh, come on. I know. I you know, know I'm going to have to, you know, suspend you. You're going to have to give me some, I don't know, some herbs or something. Um, uh, yeah. What is his Elton name? Elton John. Not, Elton John, yeah. He was there. And what I liked about Elton John being there is, of course, you know, Elton John just, you know, he was, he loved Princess Diana. He was there for Princess Diana. He wrote the rewrite, you know, at her funeral, you know, the candle in the wind just oh, touched my heart so much. Uh, so I thought that was really cool. But, yeah, there were some people there I'm going, I bet she doesn't even know some of these people. <laughs> Well, she doesn't. That's the point of a royal wedding. She doesn't know them. Yeah. Heck, I bet Harry didn't even know them. That I'm list sure was supplied didn't. by the royal accessory. Exactly. Although I do bet he does. He has at least met Elton John. Well, I'm sure he has because they used to hang out together when he was a child, when his mother used to visit the couple. Exactly. And it was good to see Elton yeah. out and about. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that I like, just because he's always been really, really close with, the, with or at least my interpretation of this being an outsider. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. I interpreted him as having a close connection with the family and with Princess Di. Mm-hmm. And, of course, both of these young men always remind me of Princess Di. I, just, I have always felt that she was just like, Wonderful and awesome, mm-hmm. you know. What you know, I was there when she got married, you know, or I wasn't there, but I was watching it, you know, and mm-hmm. you know the whole thing throughout her life, you know. She did. She got married when I got married. She had kids when I got kids. She got divorced when I got divorced. Oops, shouldn't say that. <laughs> you well, know? you know, did she kind of set it there? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think that it was interesting. Now, the other thing that I thought was interesting and kind of had to take a moment to go, okay, which ones would I invite to my wedding? Was, you know, Harry invited his five ex, his five exes. Yeah. I'm sure I would do that. You know, I didn't know he did that, but I'm pretty darn sure I wouldn't have done it. Apparently, it's tradition there that you invite your exes. Really? Mm-hmm. If I ever lived in England, I swear I wouldn't date. Well, I'd no date, honey. I, I just don't think I'd I, I think, you know, I think it's kind of, mm. But then I got to thinking, which exes would I invite to my wedding? And I thought, none of them. I have to pay for them to come party. <laughs> Maybe it's to help them get closer, although that seems like a really awfully painful thing to do. <laughs> well, I don't think it's to help them get closer. I think it's to help them say, see, you weren't it. She got you. You know? I suppose that's true. Is that a royal tradition what I found, or is that an English tradition? <laughs> that's a royal tradition. Camilla was at Diana's wedding. 
And as we all know, Camilla, you know, stuck around and, yes. you know, married Prince Charles after the divorce. But at least he waited until after Diana had crossed. And the body was, yes. you know, at 79.3. It wasn't cold, but, you know, it got there. Yeah. <sighs> yes. Yeah. I will say that you know, so, is true. Yeah. Right. You know, so that was a kind of a buzz thing. Um, there's been some more shootings. We're now at like 100. or 140 days in a year and 100 mass shootings. But I will say at least this one was a little bit better. We only lost nine. It was a handgun, not an AK-47. It's probably the first shooting this year that was not an AK-47. Uh-huh. So I think, you know, a little bit of improvement on the stupidity of our teenagers. What do you think? Well, I think, and I keep saying this over and over and over again, We have had some dramatic changes in our society, and our children are lost. And we need, and we we're not dealing with mental illness, and we're not dealing with some of these societal issues that are coming up. And we, besides the fact that we need to make our schools safe, we need to find a plan and make the schools safe. You know, and I know that they're working on this, but we really have to go here and deal with mental illness. And we have to deal with some of these, you know, because, you know, a lot of our young men are getting left behind here. And we have to look at well, why, well, what's going on, what are the changes, and what do we need to do as a society? Well, you know, you know I'm going to echo what I've been I'm sure saying. They didn't start off this lifespan, this is what I want to do. You know? Of course not. Yeah. You know, these but, are, you know, I'm going to echo off what problem. I've been saying. And I will continue to say, we need to teach our young people respect of a gun again. I agree. You know, a lot of homes I don't agree. have them. The ones that do, there's very little much of, other than that stats gun, it's in the lockbox, don't touch it. So it's a scary thing. Yeah. And what people don't get is if you apply the ideas of drinking to the ideas of guns, you're going to see that the cool factor and the scary factor isn't there anymore. And then we need to address the mental health. We need to address the, oh, let's just pop, you know, oh, they're a little hyper. So instead of putting them in basketball and soccer and Boy Scouts and making them mow the grass, we slap them on medication. Yeah. And I think you know, they're you know, hyper. They work them up. We need to look at some of the medication, too. You know, this is a multi thing that needs to happen here. It is. It yeah. is. And, of course, you know, my other standby, and a lot of people don't agree with it, we need to reinsert spankings into society. We well, didn't have this when, you, when parents bent you over the knee. Well, I know... That, you know, when my kids were growing up, all of a sudden, it wasn't okay to spank anymore. And, you know, if your kid asked mm-hmm. us in the store, you, you you didn't dare spank in the store. People would come up and talk to you. And, you know, I think, you know, mm-hmm. discipline needs to be within reason. I think there are appropriate well, times for Well, there's a there difference between... There is a difference between bending a child over your knee and giving it a good, hard slap and then beating the hell out of them. I agree. Okay. I agree. This worked for centuries. Centuries. People have been given children spankings. Probably since the dawn of family civilization, there's been some form of corporal punishment. Somewhere along the 50s and 60s, somebody got a little cuckoo, got a little fearful of about, I don't know. Or they just got stupid. And that's when we start seeing that degeneration of respect, of honoring for lives, of having a respect for, you know, elders, of having a respect. And now they don't even, you know, they think, bang, bang, you know, I don't like my schoolmates, so I'll shoot them. With the big scary gun that I'm not allowed to touch. 
yeah, like I said, I think there needs to be some societal changes, you know, that need to happen here. And, you know, mm-hmm. I have to believe that technology in some ways has had an influence, too. I'm not really sure where. I'm not sure if it's a game, Facebook, mm-hmm. I'm not sure if it's a combination there or not. But, you know, we've got I don't think it's the games. Here. You know. You don't think? My husband, he plays 16 hours every two days at least. He's on that game at least four, at least four hours a day. It's his wow. form of entertainment. Okay? He, gets, he makes good money off of it. He hasn't shot up a school yet. He won't even touch my gun, much less anything else. And he does the bang, bang, yes, shoot him up. You know, so come on. Well, yeah, he has a gentle soul until you look at him and tell him you ain't ordering pizza again. Then he ain't (laughs) too gentle. (laughs) You know, so don't give me this, oh, it's the video games. Or, you know, in the 80s, oh, it's the music. Please. Uh It's none of that. The problem starts at home, and it echoes into the school, and it echoes into society. That's where it's at. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Okay. You know, we've yeah, we, gotten um, past, you know. Yeah. Ready? I'm here. Yeah, I'm still here. You were starting. You were starting, and I backed okay. off so that you could keep running. Oh, Okay. <laughs> I need to get in shape a little bit here, you know. Well, I, I just feel like I know that we're beginning to have discussions. I know mm-hmm. a lot of people aren't so sure because we've had discussions over the years. But it's a multi-layer thing that needs to happen here. And right. And I think we need to get rid of the bubble that we put our children in. Right. You know. you know, because a lot of them really but, don't understand about life sometimes. And there's some really great kids out there. There we are. I know I'm the grandmother of one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know. There's some really great kids. There's some great children that understand themselves. But there's some children out there that I think have been wrapped in bubble wrap too long. Could be too. And it gets a little, yeah. You know, but, you know, yeah. we got a guest today. We do. So why don't we do this? Why don't we take a fast break, and then we'll come back, and we'll bring our guest on, and we'll be talking about her new book. And, you know, she's Absolutely. a clinical psychologist, so she may want to throw a little bit that, this way on that tail. Oh. So, yeah. We'll see you all in a minute. So, see you in a minute. And you'll find us at www.themagichappens.com, your free online magazine. Are you looking for loving, caring, spiritual answers? Then you need to give Rainy a call. Her number is 303 416 2977. She's able to give you a reading, see what your life path holds, plus what the angels and crossover loved ones has to say about it. Visit PsychicRainyLove.com for more details. And remember, Rainy spelled R A I N E. As a busy modern woman, I'm constantly on the go. Having to make multiple stops while I'm out shopping or getting things done just doesn't work for me. That's why I love going to the Crystal Lotus Shop for every one of my metaphysical needs. They have all the basics like stones, candles, sage, plus they carry jewelry, herbs, cards, a variety of unique gifts, and several other items you're probably looking for. Uh Uh-oh, sounds like my husband's old college injury flared up again. That's okay. I can count on the team of healers at the Crystal Lotus to fix him right up. They offer massage, Reiki, Kalamni, as well as other energy modalities, all performed by licensed, highly trained, and gifted practitioners. And while he's being taken care of, 
I'll sit down and get some guidance by one of their accomplished psychic readers. Oh, and did I mention they do custom orders and have gift certificates as well? They even offer yoga several days a week for all levels of experience. Plus, the last Saturday of every month, they have Psychic Saturday, where they offer discounts on readings as well as many healing sessions. Stop in to meet Shauna and the rest of the family there. They're located at 89 Old Main Plaza in St. Albans, where the Loop Pharmacy used to be. Or give them a call at 304-729-8055. Crystal Lotus, taking the spirit where the body cannot go. So I'm a cat, and I just moved in with this new human, and she's got this little toy she's always playing with, all day long. Tap, 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 bloop, bloop. She can't put it down. There it is. Oh, and get this. She even talks to it. Last week, she asked it for Chinese, and guess what? Egg rolls showed up, like magic. Humans have cool toys. A person is the best thing to happen to a shelter pet. Be that person. Adopt. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the shelterpetproject.org. Did you know that you can have a reading with ASIN in person? Or you can reach him by phone, chat, or even text message. You should really check out his site, asinite.com, or give him a call. His number is 304-584-3592. Relax. Have a cup of your favorite topics with your hosts, Ace and Knight and Rain Love. There's nothing like a good conversation to warm your soul and give your spirit a break now and then. Ace and Love have such a wonderful way of exploring topics like psychic phenomena, important topics in our daily lives from a psychic's point of view, and you never know who else will stop by. The Psychic Coffee Shop, live on Blog Talk Radio. So come on in. We made a fresh cup of Java just for you. All right. Let's get Miss Rainy back. Where'd you go, Rainy? All right, there you are. All right. <laughs> How are you doing? <laughs> you know, bouncing around here. You know, the switchboard won't stay strong. But here we go. So we've got Jeanette Morena, Ph.D., clinical psychologist, speaker, and workshop facilitator, and author of two books, one including The Fertile Path, A Guide to Journeying to Mindfulness and Compassion. In her work, she shares her own lessons of healing, the journey through infidelity and choosing uh, infertility, and those of women and men who she's worked with, bringing the teachings and practices of mindfulness to the challenges of fertility. Welcome. Hello, Jeanette. Welcome. Hi there. Uh, Glad to be on your show. Right. Well, thank you. Glad and, you know, I also have noticed you. that you went to uh, University of Nevada. I have a niece uh, who goes there, and she her she's uh, emph- her emphasis is journalism. Oh, great! Yeah, I think it has a really good journalism program. That's why she chose it. <laughs> it, it, it. Yeah, yeah, it's a great school. I really, I, I really enjoyed it there, and um, yeah, I'm sure she is enjoying it. Well, welcome, and, uh, you know, we, um, well, where would you like to start tonight? Do you want to, um, you know, make any um, comments with regard to what we were talking about, or do you just want to go right into your book, and uh, kind of where would you like to lead with this? Well, I think to, um, I think probably just go straight into the book, Um so that we can have as much time as possible to be able to, to talk about this topic. Absolutely. Okay. Well, tell us what inspired you with this book. So um, uh, 
about, oh, somewhere between 25 to 30 years ago, um, my husband and I experienced uh, fertility challenges. And uh, so in the process of about six years, we uh, lost a lot of pregnancies, uh, tried IVF, in vitro fertilization, uh, donor egg IVF a number of times. Uh, we tried adoption, and then finally surrogacy is what worked out for us. And so we have a daughter who's 23 years old. Um, this was, in those days, uh, traditional surrogacy, which means that it was the egg of the surrogate, um, uh, getting pregnant through artificial insemination. You don't really see that much anymore because then you would have like donor egg gestational surrogacy. Uh, so, uh, yeah, in that six year process, it was, uh, you know, the most grueling experience I've ever had. And I tried all sorts of ways to basically be okay. It impacted my, my sense of self, um, my uh my my work i was it was just hard to to be a, a psychologist and be leading four groups a, a week at that time and um you know when all sorts of stuff in my per, uh, personal life in terms of fertility was was happening and so in that process i just tried lots of different ways of being okay um that included counseling um i went on vision quests uh Using the wilderness as a as a kind of a place of healing, I tried acupuncture, went to a Buddhist bendo, um, uh, Christian church, and finally I got onto an east west path uh, that led me to India. And it was really there that um, towards the end of my of this journey that I really be, began to believe that I would have a child if I opened the possibility. And when I got back from that uh, pilgrimage. My husband met me at the airport, and uh, he had a pillow under his shirt um, indicating that our surrogate was pregnant. So, oh. um, yeah, so it was a it was a a real journey. And um, a few years later, I found mindfulness, and I realized that mindfulness is just the the perfect antidote to deal with the different challenges that fertility presents. And so, I developed an uh, eight week uh, program. Uh, that's mindfulness based. Um, I gave that in both a group format and for individuals in my private practice. And the book is the um, expression of this program. So it's really a guide. You could use it to as a uh, to just put yourself um, through this program. Um, it comes with audio meditations that you can listen to, and uh, it just takes you down this whole journey to um, work on the different issues and to open up and and uh, be there for, you know, how a child may be coming to you. Absolutely. Well, what you know, I can kind of imagine that, you know, there are some emotional challenges, you know, especially we as women, you know, and what you might go through in that process and how that would affect you. And also with so many people, waiting to have children these days, this probably is uh, definitely a question that comes into mind for a lot of people, wouldn't you say? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I I mean, what we find is that about one out of every six couples of childbearing age um, have Mm -hmm. infertility issues, um, and that it has somewhat increased because of women going into careers and... um, I mean, just even a generation, and certainly more back. Um, you know, women were getting pregnant in their in their early 20s, and now it's in the 30s, late 30s. And and what you find is that fertility starts declining in your in your 30s, and really kind of dropping in your 40s. Yeah, so it's yeah. it has become more more of an issue. Yeah. Well, can you explain to us what mindfulness is? Sure. So um, mindfulness is basically just simply being aware of what's happening right now in the present moment without wishing that it was different. Um, We tend to have a lens of judgment that inclines us to categorize what's happening into good or bad. We like this. We don't like it. This is uh, we're succeeding. We're failing. 
and we we tend to cling to what we want, kind of push away or reject what we don't want. And basically, we wish things were different. And so mindfulness is being in the present moment with unconditional acceptance. Um, so it's learning to accept reality for what it is with a sense of peace and stability so we can better deal with life's challenges. Yeah, because you never know what child needs to come in. It's just supposed to be that parent of and how they're supposed to get there. At least that's my thought. <laughs> yeah, you know? I, I think I think there's a lot of mystery. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, it's uh and that's the thing about infertility. It, it it's really loss of control. And we try to we, we believe that we have more control than we do and so we try to kind of use control as a as a way of coping and that's you know, trying and then effort usually equating with success that you really put your mind to something that you can succeed. Um, off, oftentimes, you know, like study for tests and, and maybe pass it. And, but uh, when it comes to, to fertility, you you really don't have any control over the, the outcome. And so right. mindfulness, uh, what, what I really like about mindfulness, which is seen as uh, the heart of Buddhist psychology, which is all about looking at how we get stuck and how we can open up, um, that what we what we know is that there's, three things that we need to be in harmony with in, in life. Um, that one is life is difficult. Life invariably has suffering. But what happens is that we resist. So that with infertility, you know, it's like, why is this happening to me? This is terrible. And and, and it is. It, it is so, so hard. But the more that we re- resist, the harder it, it is. And what we need to do is kind of open up to it. Um, yeah. And then secondly, that everything, you know, according to um, that these are the, the, the three character, characteristics of reality. Um, the second one is that everything changes and nothing remains the same. Um, and so mindfulness teaches us how to ride on the waves of change. And then the third one is that we tend to personalize experience and see things as like they're, it's happening to me. And so mindfulness puts on this neutral lens and so rather than trying to change the situation you're trying to change how you're relating to the situation um and uh and that's what makes all the difference absolutely absolutely um you talk about mindfulness being helpful for infertility um is it that by going into this state of mind that it, it can be helpful in getting you pregnant, or is, is it more to help you deal with it? Well, both. Um, I, yeah, I, I would say um, both. There's been uh, uh, studies that have looked at um, um, uh, psychological intervention groups. Usually they're a kind of mind-body groups. Mindfulness can be a part but um, the studies haven't included a strictly a mindfulness uh, group. But in um, this uh, big meta-analysis study that looked at 39 uh, studies that were really high-powered studies, um, and they had different intervention groups, that what they found uh, was that uh, women in those intervention groups were, in fact, twice as likely to become pregnant than those who were in the control groups or basically the control groups, meaning not not um, receiving psychological or um, emotional treatment. And so what we do know is that there does, does seem to be a stress fertility uh, connection. Now, that doesn't mean that if you have blocked fallopian tubes, that it's, it's going to, you know, uh, right. taking away stress is going to unblock them. So there's, there's certainly uh, issues that are... Um, that can't be remedied, but but overall, if you look at medical situations or really anything, uh, stress doesn't help. And so, um, mindfulness is. Uh, there's been a lot of studies around mindfulness, and it definitely does help to reduce stress. And 
In fact, there's a program called Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction, and it's all about how to reduce stress with the use of, of mindfulness. Yes. And you know what? I'm a really strong proponent of that. Um, you know, you know, just different experiences in my life. You know, when I'm not, when I haven't been dealing with the stress or not knowing how to accept the situation, whatever it is, that kind of allowing myself to go through the experience and go, okay, what am I supposed to learn through this? What am I supposed to get through this? As opposed to why is this happening to me? Makes a really huge difference, you know. Oh, see, I, I, absolutely. I, uh, I mean, I, I think you've really hit it, you know, right at that at the center. That what yeah. happens with infertility is that um, we we tend to really take it personally. So, um, womanhood is oftentimes equated with motherhood, and so mm-hmm. if you're not able to get pregnant or become, you know, or or, or have a child, then you don't feel like you're really um, whole and yeah. uh, virility equated with masculinity and so um, men also can you know really have their self-esteem impacted and the, oh, the problem is that you start really taking this this whole situation which is a medical condition like a, mm-hmm. um, as, as your personal identity right and um, right that makes it that makes it so hard and so being able to kind of step back and 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 not have it be your personal narrative but look at okay so how can i how can i work with this um right. that that's what mindfulness teaches us to do to put on this neutral lens and see okay well how can we work work with our our thoughts and our emotions right. and our and our body right our, exactly you know, yeah yeah, and, and, you know, I think that's so important. I know, like, with my son and his wife, they just had my first grandchild. And oh, they were not expected to have a baby. In fact, it was made very clear because of both of their health conditions that it was not likely to happen. And it did. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh. Yeah. yeah. And so I know that they, they went through some of those fears, too. But I know they didn't have to go through some of the stuff that you had to go through. But, you know, I can well imagine, you know, how it feels to go through something like that. And I'm sure that, you know, our listeners have different experiences that maybe it's not in fertility, but it's other things where you feel less than, you know, less than feminine. You know, say you're, you know, dealing with cancer or, or whatever it is that I'm sure that these techniques could be very helpful. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the, the 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 practices that are in the book and the exercises. Um, I mean, all all of everything that's mindfulness based are is 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 it's been around for twenty five hundred years. I mean, there's you know the different practices are, are the basic kind of meditation practices that apply to to everything. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. 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 And and uh, infertility actually, you're, um, th- there's been four studies that have looked at the depression, the degrees of depression and anxiety for women with the diagnosis of infertility, is equal to women with the diagnosis of cancer, HIV, and heart disease. Um, so, oh. Oh. It is, yeah. So it's 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 really it's really big. I I think overall people don't really get how. What a, what a crisis this really is for people. Well, yeah, you know, I've also, you know, heard that, you know, sometimes there are certain conditions and diseases that, I don't know about men, but certainly for women that we are more um, prone to if we have not had children, you know. Uh, so, again, I can't help but imagine that emotional, spiritual work would also be very helpful, you know, with stuff like that because, you know, they always say you take care of the physical, emotional, and spiritual parts of your life. That it's all inclusive. Yeah, I I, sure I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I do. I, I do think it's emotional, physical, and I mean spiritually. Uh, I mean, one of the things that happens is that 
uh, infertility is seen as a life crisis because it impacts every area of your life, your relationship with your, you have a partner, um, and your friends and family, because oftentimes they'll say something and and they just kind of said the, what feels like the wrong thing and can impact your, your work, like it certainly did with, with me, and the sense of time and money, uh, and and also your relationship with God or your higher power, um, because of this tendency to take it personally. I worked with a lot of people who feel like um, they're being punished, um, or that they're you know that they that, that they're out of sync with just just that the the, the, the their, their 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 sense of of um, the relationship with 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 God or what they believe in. So it, it does. It really does impact people spiritually, and I do think that that so much of the the need is to um, take it away from that personal dimension. And uh, one of the things that mindfulness does is that it's it, it's based on this concept of original goodness. And what that means is that we're already whole and complete as we are, with all of yeah. our imperfections and, and inadequacies. And so yeah. you don't need to, like, try to prove yourself to be okay, that you're already okay who you are. Yeah, I'm right. perfectly and wonderfully made. So, Ethan. Hello. Hello. Yeah, I'm just sitting over <laughs> sipping my coffee. Mm. Where does the compassion come in here? You know, we've been talking about the mindfulness and, you know, like accepting some things. But where does the compassion fit into the program? So the the first thing that I do with this program, and it's just, it's very sequentially based. So first is learning how to just use the breath to, like, turn off the stress response uh, which actually what happens when you're in a stressful situation is you just get into this kind of chest breathing, what's called conditioning breathing. And actually, in many ways, most of us breathe from our chest a, a lot of the times because life is pretty stressful. And so the first thing that, that we do is teach people how to just breathe from the belly. And um, abdominal breathing turns on the relaxation response. And so when you're breathing from the belly, you can't be stressed out. So that's the first thing to just connect with that. And then we teach mindfulness um, in terms of using the, the breath to get anchored to the present moment so that you can, you know, stay put right in the present and not get distracted into past and future. And then it's working with the body um, so that you can get grounded in the body. Um, mindfulness is an embodied practice, and so it's how the body responds to thoughts, emotions, uh-huh. and experiences. And then it's it's using mindfulness to work with your thoughts and your emotions. And then what happens is that at, after you've kind of uh, uh, been taught how to work w- with your with your thoughts, then the compassion practices come in. And compassion practices is really about how to how to be able to hold it all because it's this is pretty heavy duty stuff and so compassion is really about you know taking care of yourself like you would be taking care of a of a of a little baby or someone that that you love and so the, the compassion practices are being able to like send ourselves loving kindness you know may I be safe and may I be happy and healthy and and have ease and well being and um cultivate um gratitude and generosity um and so the compassion practices are, are really about how to hold the experiences with an open heart. Wonderful. And that's mm-hmm. about self love. I'm sorry, what was that? That's about self-love, loving yourself. Yeah, I yeah, can absolutely. If, I, I can imagine in not practicing that, that maybe potentially we would, as you were even, ta- I think you were talking about this a little bit earlier about 
sort of blaming yourself, you know, what's wrong with me, bringing yourself down. I can imagine that that would be a really important process to help somebody not to hold on to all that negative energy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when in the mindfulness part, there's a you know, there's a whole section on how to work with your thoughts, and so it's it's looking at these thoughts like, um, you know, I'm, um, I, I, you know, I'll never have a baby. Um, I don't deserve to have a baby. You know, there's there's a lot of guilt and all sorts of emotions that get into it, and so. And so in mindfulness of thoughts, it's looking at, you know, when you look at that thought, it's you've totally, like, interpreted this very slanted way. It's, it's totally in this, in, with, in this judgmental way. And mindfulness is all about, about non-judgmental awareness. It's taking off the judgment. And so it's breaking down that thought, you know, look at, looking at, like, where did that come from? And uh-huh. and to see that you know it's not true, and then the compassion comes in, in you know in being able to learn how to, you know, love yourself, and that which is what you know what you're talking about, and and so there's there's different practices that 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 help to kind of um, bring in these um, messages of kind. Uh, and these are in, in meditation practices and all sorts of different practices to learn how to, like, you know, love yourself. Yeah. And, you know, I have a question. How many of these couples have you worked with, whether they've done IVF or they've done, you know, the surrogate route or they've even went ahead and done the adoption route? That once they've gotten the first child or, you know, they've gotten, you know, adopted two children or whatever, because I've seen this happen a lot in my practice, and they're out of that moment of I'll never have a baby, I won't have a baby, they have the baby, they're raising the baby, and then boom, the wife appears up pregnant. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Mm-hmm. So... Well, yeah. So first of all, I I've been specializing in this field for about 20 years now, and so I I've worked with hundreds of of people. Mm-hmm. Um, I I I used to be a, the mind body program coordinator for a fertility uh, practice, and that's where I did uh, groups. And so I've worked with a lot of people in 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 these different groups, and then I have this private practice, and so. It's really been, you know, hundreds, and people have had babies in all sorts of different different ways, um, and mm-hmm. that's by you know just getting pregnant or going to adoption or whatever. And there there is something about and I, I've I've heard a couple things. One that you know just the law of probability is that five percent of the time, you know, like even if you're the best therapist in the world, 5% of the time you'll have patients that aren't going to like you. So uh, there's always this 5% uh, that that just things th- things are just going to be the, the, you know, the opposite or you're going to fall into. So uh-huh. one of the things that I've heard is that is that, you know, these stories kind of pop out, you know, Someone adopted a child, and then and then no sooner did they adopt it, then they got pregnant, and they were trying for like ten years. Um, so mm-hmm. I've heard those stories that they just kind of pop out because they're memorable stories. But there's all there was also this study, and it looked at letting go, and uh, letting go meaning, you know, kind of what we've been talking about, just being mm-hmm. able to accept what's happening because. That's what's happening. Just kind of be able to to be to be with it, not fight it, not force it, not push so hard to try to make things happen. And like in that study, it it did it did show that that there was a higher pregnancy rate, and including in the in in the, the studies that I was uh, quoting, the intervention studies, it does show that there mm-hmm. does seem to be a best fertility relationship. So I think that that there. There, there, I, I, in my own clinical practice, I do find that sometimes that happens. 
that once the person has decided, oh, I'm just, you know, this this is never going to work out, but you know, it's okay. Um, and then and then it happens. Um, so you know, you're you're talk, talking about the word uh, mystery. I mean, it's a very mysterious process. Um, mm-hmm. Things happen in mysterious kind of ways, but I. I do think that it is about about you know being with what's happening and not trying to 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 try to force it to be otherwise. Right. And, that, yeah, and that's right. what mindfulness is all about. Yeah, and yeah. I've always heard. So, for where years can our years listeners control. get your books? Um, well, it's it's sold on on Amazon. So if you just look up either my name or the book, um, the book's title is A Fertile Path, and it just comes it comes right up. Um, and uh, or you can look up my name, Jeanette Marotta, um, on Amazon, and it comes up that way. You could also go to my website, JeanetteMarotta.com.com, and then it takes you. There's a link there, and it takes you to Amazon. So that's that's. The easiest uh, way, just either go directly to Amazon or go to my website. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, you know, are you do, still doing the workshops? You know, can people get involved with them somehow? Um, I had a lot of these workshops going on, um, I mean, over the last eight years. And right now um, I don't have any that I have scheduled. Um, I'm going to be giving a workshop um, in uh, a Solomar, that's in California, to uh, therapists um, about like leading these groups. Uh, but um, this this book is really, uh, you know, it, it's really intended to be a, a self help uh, book. And uh, one of the things that, that I, I think could be really wonderful about it is that if people know other people who are struggling with fertility, you can use this book as your guide, and each chapter could be like a week, and you can have your own kind of group uh, process uh-huh. going. Um, on, on my website, there's all of the different meditations. All you have to do is go to the website. And then the the meditations are, are accessed there, and they're all described in the book. And so you just go through like each chapter is can be one week, and there's there's your whole group experience. Uh, so that that's that's how what I sort of it's kind of how I've wrapped up um, this this program in this book form and made it available mm-hmm. really for anyone wherever you live to be able to access it. And, and also people who like are uh, therapists and wa- wanting to lead these, these groups or do it in their practices, they could use this book mm-hmm. as, as their guide uh, for, for their patients. Yeah. Yeah. Because I'm sure they have support groups out there. You know, I, I can't imagine that they don't. Yeah. I'm sure there's yeah, support there's groups. Like, yeah. Uh, Re- Resolve uh, is the the the, the uh, National Infertility Organization, so that's uh-huh. a good resource for people to look up. Um, again, that's Resolve, and uh, and then just you know if people are going to a fertility center, they could see what might be offered there. Um, uh, the other thing is just look up you know fertility groups, but but something that could also be helpful is looking for a mindfulness group. Um, and because, uh, you know, mindfulness can help with any situation. Uh, right. And uh, it's really great for reducing stress. So there's, you know, uh, there's inside meditation centers that have, um, that, that lead mindfulness programs. There's mindfulness-based stress reduction. Those, those programs are all over the country. So that, that's another way to access Live groups. I think that's really good because that was one of the first things I thought of too. Is all the different ways that you could use this, you know, along with infertility, infertility, and all the different things that sometimes you know people have to go through, whether it's illness, whether it's loss, you know, in some way, you know, that those techniques could be so helpful. 
And, you know, we just uh-huh. appreciate so much for you coming on the show tonight and sharing your story with us and sharing a little bit about your techniques uh, with us. Um, and uh, don't forget, everybody, you know, you know, go on Amazon.com and uh, look for this wonderful book. And uh, you have anything to add to that, Aston? Thanks for coming, hon. And, you know, hop back when your third book comes out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you so point. much. That <laughs> 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 was a real pleasure being on this show. Uh, well, you, thank you. Too, and you have a wonderful evening. Okay, thanks. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, Miss Rainey, what are you up to this week? Um, <laughs> well, uh, it's a little bit more low key this week. I'm just sticking around and uh, just taking uh, calls from my site locally. Uh, I am going to try to get out and do a little sunshine, a little bit of spring cleaning and gardening out there if I get a chance to. I'm just kind of hanging low mm-hmm. for right now. Well, you know, I can't hang low. I tend to hang, know. you know, fly all around the place. So Wednesday, <laughs> Thursday, and Friday, I'll be at the Crystal Lotus Shop, and then on Saturday, you guys can come out to the Crystal Kingdom and enjoy ACR. I believe Six Foot Deep's going to be there. Gypsy Rhythm's going to be there. I think that you'll enjoy it. For those that don't know where it is, it's in Ordnance Park in St. Albans, West Virginia, and you know I'll be doing readings and. You know, the other fun stuff I do at festival, stop by, grab a selfie, you know, whatever, I'm gay. So until next week, thanks for listening, and we'll see you. Good night, Rainy. Good night, all. Good night, Ethan. Good night, all. Did you know that you can have a reading with ASIN in person? Or you can reach him by phone, chat, or even text message. You should really check out his site, asinite.com, or give him a call. His number is 304-584-3592. Are you looking for loving, caring, spiritual answers? Then you need to give Rainy a call. Her number is 303-416-2977. She's able to give you a reading, see what your life path holds, plus what the angels and crossover loved ones has to say about it. Visit PsychicRainyLove.com for more details. And remember, Rainy spelled R-A-I-N-E. You're listening to the Magic Happens Radio Network, sponsored by the Magic Happens Magazine. You'll find us at www.themagichappens.com.